There's a sense in the United States that they are a growing threat. We're close. If we go to a military war, it'll almost certainly be the Taiwan issue. So that could be called containment. I think we want to contain China. Their concerns are mostly the domestic concerns. How do they deal with the demographics issue? How do they deal with um, their domestic. own domestic issues? You know, when you run a country, the major issues are the internal issues. How do you make sure you deal with corruption? How do you deal with all the issues that they face? Poverty in the east and the western part of China, environmental issues, the property bubble that's bursting, the COVID issue. My assessment would be that they made a serious mistake in not taking the vaccines that we had to offer. There was a process in which they handled it fabulously in the beginning. And everybody was thinking, okay, they're on top of the world. But then they have no COVID in China, so they don't have immunity and they didn't have a vaccine that was effective. And as a result, they got into the situation that they're in. China and the opposition is as strong as the United States and its allies. And so we have a conflict. And there are five kinds of wars. And they start in this order, just sequentially, typically. A trade war, a technology war, a geopolitical influence war. Then you get into a capital and economic warfare, which we are now with sanctions. They always happened in history. And then there's a military war. And so you could see that progression happen through time. And that creates a template. So I like to look at the template and then plot dots to see how we're transpiring relative to that template. China owes a lot of American debt. Yeah. Should we worry about that? I think they should worry about it. I don't believe that they'll sell the debt. And if they sell the debt, we would, again, like others, just print more money and it would depreciate in value. I think that they know and have known for quite a long time that the position that they have in that debt is something that they're going to have to stick with. The way it worked is they produced inexpensively. We all thought this is a good thing. I thought it was a good thing. And they earn money. And then they take a lot of that money that they earn and then they lend it to us. I remember when this started, the per capita income in the United States was 40 times the per capita income in China, and they're lending to us. So we borrow this money and they buy our bonds. And I don't know who got the better or worse deal, but anyway, that's what happened. So look at it this way. It's a big thing. The population in China, the capitas, are more than four times that in the United States. Since I started going to China in 1984, per capita income has increased by 27 times. If it increased to half of what the United States is, that would mean its economy would be twice the size of the United States. So it's a big force. And simultaneously, given the risks in the world, they want to be self-sufficient. And similarly, the United States wants to be more self-sufficient. And other countries are wanting to be more self-sufficient because they're worried about being cut off. The main reason that China did not denominate its exports and trade in the currency and did not denominate its lending is that they didn't want to be a threat to the United States because that's a threatening act if the United States loses. Now, we were in a different era then, just to explain it. They became the largest trading country in the world. In other words, did more trade than any other. They could have operated in their currency. In terms of lending, international lending, they're the largest lenders and they could have done that in their currency. They chose not to because they perceived that that would be a threat. They were not trying to disrupt the world order. But now we have a different set of circumstances worldwide. This leadership was the same of the same mind. And I think is pretty much today, they don't want to disrupt the world order, but they want to be as great as they can be. They want to be as rich and powerful and so on, but they don't want to disrupt the world order. If you look at history and you understand international relations, which is very much like Confucianism, what you have is called a tribute system. And that means each country is in the place. They know their place. They know the hierarchy. Like in the old days, it's almost like other countries would be almost a vassal state. You would say, I know that you have the power, you pay respect and you operate in a harmonious way. But the idea of war um, is a horrendous idea. So I think that they would probably be just as happy if you divided the world in half, their half, and we had our half, and there was peace in the world. I'm just saying an objective is not to dominate the world. An objective is to operate in a way where there is no such world. However, that they are as strong and powerful and healthy and prosperous as they can be. I think it's very difficult for a lot of Americans who hold close to them the treasured, I live the American dream, 
team. I know equal opportunity. I know the ability to speak up. I know that those types of values, but it's difficult for other Americans to understand why they have a different point of view about what works better. A very good example of a cultural case. I think it was the NBA team, an individual spoke out on Hong Kong and the Chinese not only punished that team, but they punished the NBA. And in our, like I would say, everyone should have the right to their opinions and to be able to have free expression. In their view, if somebody's doing something wrong, that they will punish the group. They'll punish the family because the group is supposed to be responsible for that. They don't understand it from the internal values way having to do with Confucianism, the history, why it's more autocratic, top down, what they believe about democracy. The Chinese leadership is paranoid mostly about maintaining the power of the Communist Party. Well, they would view that as very similar to us saying the power of the Constitution, because that is the system, that's the order. In 1949, they made a system, and that's the system. When we think of party, we think of that same multiple party type of thing. They think of it as very top-down, very hierarchical, and it's like the family. Vice President of China, Wang Qishan, described it to me. He said, it's top-down, Americans are bottom-up. And the question is, by the way, we have this issue are we fighting for that ideology? These are bigger questions. Are we fighting for a democracy and capitalism? Or do we believe that others can find their own approaches and may the best approach win out? That becomes a big question as we pursue it. So that is their approach, it may not be my approach. They will not give that approach up any more than Americans would give up the Constitution, let's say, or their freedom of speech up. So we just have to understand it's like a religion. You know, as we have different religions all around the world, they're deeply held beliefs, and each believes in that they're gonna get the right outcomes by pursuing them, and uh, what do you do about that? There's also the question of human rights, and clearly the Chinese have a different view than a lot of people around the world. How do you approach that? Well, there's me and there's every one of us. Uh, It's a cosmic question. Every one of us who buys products or all the businesses that are operating and interacting with China or operating in many countries, I could list the number of countries, the interconnectedness of the relationships with China. We import 22% of our manufactured goods comes from China. If you're buying your Apple or you're buying your sneakers, you're in a position that's somewhat similar to me in terms of thinking about what the issues are. What I do is I rely on the guidance of the government, both governments. I think in studying their dynasties, I studied the Tang dynasty, which is around 600, and I studied also other societies. It is the things that I've talked about before. It is in broad-based education. The Confucian system was the first meritocracy that came in to create broad-based education, and then they would have exams, and the people who would get the jobs would be the people who were the most capable, and they got away from corruption and those types of things. I wouldn't characterize some things as Chinese. I think that there, in the history of China, there have been good dynasties and there have been bad sure. dynasties. But there's always the common ingredients of what makes a, a country successful. And they've been that way uniquely. If you do look at the history, I've studied the powers and the different strengths. China has it through history up until around 1840, been always like number one or two in the country because of hard work, because of meritocracy, because of being highly civilized. In other words, they are working in the same direction and they operate well to be productive together.